was teaching what you taught me, but nobody wanted to listen. So you would just teach for nobody. So it doesn't matter, one person, a thousand, million. But it's a change, right? So um, we've got two brothers and we've got some of the sisters that are there. So we are going to do some at the end of it. The end of it, slowly. Inna Rabbika la shadid, right? A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Inna batasha Rabbika la shadid. Innahu huwa yubdi'u wa yu'idu wa huwa al-ghafuru al-wadud. Dhu al-arush al-majid. فعال لما يريد هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثمود بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ so الله سبحانه وتعالى at the end of this surah, yani he, he says, Inna batasha rabbika la shadid. Now, in the Arabic language, al batsh is already something strong and severe. So, the batsh, so the batsh is, is something strong. Now, Allah says, Inna batasha rabbika la shadid. The batsh is always shadid. Now, so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he emphasizes on the batsh to be shadid. It means it is very severe, no? and that's why because the 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 the, the batash yani, is already, as I said, yani, a, a very severe, harsh punishment. In the Now, the, the thing is, when you look at the the way it is the, at the construct, it says in uh, the Lord of your Lord. So it is to say you have nothing to fear, Ya Muhammad. In the Rabbika la shadid. He's your Lord, meaning in your favor. So don't worry when I speak of the batsh, you're not intended. Inna batasha rabbika la shadid. No. And then and it is definitely, and Allah emphasizes on it with the lamb, la shadidun. Could have been inna batasha rabbika shadid. La shadid. And it's truly no, strong, severe, and it's about the punishment. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the inna in front of it. Inna, batasha, la, and shadid. And he's emphasizing four times on the, the, the punishment being severe. Inna hu huwa yubadi huwa yu'id. What does it say in English? Where he alone originates and brings back again. Originates and brings back again. Is that the Sheikh Nuh translation? So um, here, originate and, 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 and brings back again. Um, so According to Imam, Imam, I think Imam, was it Imam al-Mawardi? Or, uh, yes, definitely Imam Ibn Jawzi as well. There were four, five opinions about inna batasha rabbika la shadid, inna hu huwa yubadi huwa yu'id. So, and he says one of the the meanings of yubadi huwa yu'id, yani huwa yubadi hu al-batashata wa yu'idu hu fil ukhra. Ay fi dunya wa fil ukhra. Yani the, the punishment of your Lord is severe, in this life and the next. That is, يُبْدِئُ وَيُعِيد. Some would say, يُبْدِئُ وَيُعِيد, and he's the one that brings alive and takes life. Others would say the other way around. He's the one that takes life and then gives life again. So it all depends on, on, on what they say. Uh, but in very brief, يعني, it, it, it includes all of that. Now, when we you know that إِنَّهُ هُوَ يُبْدِئُ وَيُعِيد, then you also see that sometimes your worship or your aspiration or inspiration or your motivation Yani increases and then it decreases. 
Now Allah, you, you introduce or Allah introduces a worship into your life and then goes away, it fades away. That's Yubadi wa Yu'id as well. Now everything, he brings everything, he kicks us everything and can take it away as well. No? And sometimes that's the same with a disease. You have a disease, then it goes away, then it comes back. And maybe then it then it goes away again. So it is like high tide and low tide. Now he begins the high tide, but then he stops it. He's the one that does it. Imagine if Allah Jalla wa Allah wouldn't have created low tide. We would all be dead. Can you imagine? Like just high tide all the time. Um, so Allah Jalla wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he, he did this for us. So inna hu huwa yubadi'u wa yu'id wa huwa al-ghafoor wal-wadud. Huwa al-ghafoor, yani al-ghafoor, the one that forgives, and al-wadud, yani he forgives those among the disbelievers who wrong the believers and perform tawbah. He forgives them. And he's al-wadud. Why does he say wadud? While in reality, the only thing that was mentioned was punishment. Um, the believers being punished and burnt and suffering and persecuted and how can you claim that this is love? It is because we look at nata'ij al-umur, which means the final destination of things. Like we already said, people want to go to, through difficulty in order to achieve something nice in life, right? They go through difficulty in order to achieve something. So that's the same thing. You want to go to Jannah, you go through this hard, to, through harshness. That's it. No? So this is why his love is, is yani, how can I say, if you're a believer and you go through difficulties, then that is a proof of his love for you. Because you look at the end result, not at the, the stage where you are in. If people who, who want to achieve something in life would not keep the end goal in front of their eyes, they would give up. They would say, why am I suffering? Why am I lifting weights until I can't lift my arms anymore? You know, why am I doing this? Ah, okay, that's the reason. So we keep on going. Like some people keep on doing the same movement in Taijitsu or in Jiu-Jitsu and they, if they really want to distinguish themselves from others, they keep on doing the same movement over and over again, over and over again, until it becomes that muscle memory and they don't think anymore. They know that it's worth it. And that's the same thing, Yani. When you go through these difficulties in dunya, it is, you have to keep in your mind that it's worth it, even if you don't understand it now. It's worth it because when you see the results, you will see that it was worth it. And yes, you are ready to suffer for me to, to achieve many things in life. To, to, to get to Jannah, you suffer as well. That's just the way it is. Okay? So, Al-Wadud, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the one that gives love. According to some, like, like the, some of the Mufassirina said, Al-Wadud huwa ladhi la walada lah. Al-Wadud is the one who has no child. Al-Ghafoor, Al-Wadud. So they said, yani, and they, 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 yani, they used one of the pre-Islamic po poems to show that they would use Al-Wadud as yani, a, a woman without a child. Um, so he will Ghafoor Al-Wadud. So what would that mean? It's not the strongest opinion. I just share this with you. What would this mean? And he's Al-Ghafoor and he has no child, meaning that he will not um, judge in the light of necessities or, or being connected to someone. Like when you're connected to someone, you will be um, what you will be milder in your judgment, right? Okay, that's my mother, my father. They've wronged someone, but I'm going to try to, you know, soften. And and, and so Allah is not a wadud, meaning he has no children. Not he's not a wadud, his name. So meaning like, don't think that you are his chosen ones just because you're Muslims. You understand? Like he will judge you like... Like he will judge the kafir. There is no difference whatsoever. That's the weaker opinion. So al-wadud means the giver of love, the grantor of love. Jalla We spoke about that last week, right? In the names of Allah, Jalla wa'ala. Wa huwa al-ghafoor al-wadud dhu al-arshi al-majid. There are two ways here. The qira'atan is sahihatan. Two correct ways. It's wa huwa al-ghafoor al-wadud dhu al-arshi al-majidi or dhu al-arshi al-majidu. Dhu al-arshi. So we have Dhul Arsh al Majidi and Dhul Arsh al Majidu. So what is it in Hafs? Majidu. 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 What is it in Hafs? Oh, I, I didn't know because it's, it's a stop. So ah, okay. What is it in Hafs? Majidu. Majidu. So what's the translation? The incomparably noble possessor of the. 
from the very term. Okay, yes. So the Al Majid, when it's Al Majidu, no? then it is referring to Allah. In the Qira'ah where it says Dul Ash al Majidi, it would be referring to the noble throne. No? A, these are two Qira'at. So Dul Ash al Majid. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says Dul Ash, you don't always have to go back to okay, that means throne. No, it just means authority. It has the ultimate power, the ultimate authority um, that can't be stopped. And yani nobody can stop him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, from punishing. So Dhul Arsh, meaning yani he's, he has the power. That's what it means with Dhul Arsh. Yes, that he has a throne. Um, but it means Dhul Arsh, yani the, the only one in power. Allah. Dhul Arsh, Al-Majid. So Al-Majid, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it says noble, or what does it say? Forever the doer of all he wills, the one before, uh, the incomparably noble possessor of the very throne. Yeah, the possessor is Dhu. No? The Dhu means the possessor of. No. And then he says, And yani he does whatsoever he wants or wills. Now, this refers to the four foundations of the Iman bil Qadr. Qadr. The Iman bil Qadr, the Iman in, in predestination and, and everything which has to do with it, there are four, yeah, there are four what? There are four foundations and pillars. Who knows them? Who knows the four foundations or pillars of belief in Al Qadr? The predestination. Yeah. One, one is an Allah alimun. So Allah knows, and they say what takes place is in light with what He knew, um, and what He knew is what He wanted. So the first thing is Allah subhanahu wa taala, the qadr and qada they take place, and in line with what He knew since beginninglessness. What he will uh, always knew and he will not any yani, forget. The second thing is the Mashiach. Allah wants everything. Um, so Allah wants everything. So this is where we as Muslims need to man up or woman up. And it is we have to say Allah wanted it, not Allah allowed it. And if you uh, then rebel against Allah, oh, why did he want this? Then fight with him. Fight with him. But he wants it. No. He, what happened? He wanted it. You don't agree? Look for another Lord. It's very simple. And nobody forced you to be a Muslim. Okay? But don't be half a Muslim. Like where you go cherry picking. Oh, this I like, this I don't. And start questioning Allah. When you say that you believe in Allah, then you know that he's your master, your king. And that everything is his possession and not yours. You didn't possess anything to start with. Everything that we were given was temporarily and not forever. Okay? So that's the first thing. So we don't say he allows. Because allowing things makes him passive. Like, oh, yeah, okay, I will allow that. No, he wants it. Done. And how you perceive it good or bad, goes back to your misinterpretation of why God wants something. If you see me laying down on the street and you see me knocking on somebody's chest from the back, right? I go like, boom, boom. You say, Astaghfirullah, Suleiman, what are you doing? Ah, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were, what? Trying to save his life. At the same, I would send my, my child, may I not preserve him, to a surgeon, right? Like, ah, subhanAllah, in the first three weeks, late. He had an infection that was going to, to his, his brain. So he, subhanAllah, yeah, they, they had to, you know, how do you call it? Intravenous. Intravenous thing. And they couldn't find his veins because it was that, that, that small, right? And then we went together and they, they tried like 20 times. And the little one was screaming. And then they did again when he was three months. But he couldn't open his eyes. His eyes were completely closed until it was six months. So the first six months almost of his life, he, he was not able to see. Yeah. So, and we didn't know whether he was awake or sleeping. 
you see, because it was like that. So the infection was going there. And then they try, you know, they, they put it into his veins. And then my wife said, do you want to go today? I will go tomorrow. And then eventually I ended up going every day. And then so it was terrible to see this. And then you have to convince yourself that it's for the good. You see, it's for the good. So what did the child do wrong? You ask yourself, what did the child do wrong? Do we believe that it is possible that the child does not feel it? Do you understand? Like the baby who's in pain. Do we believe that it is a test for the parent, but that actually the baby on the inside is just happy and doesn't experience any pain? And then what if the baby experiences pain but dies before becoming an adult? So it was not to expiate the future sins. So what was it for then? What you need to differentiate between Barakulofikum is the ancient soul, the soul within the young body. The soul within the body is thousands, thousands of years old. You see? But it cannot use the body to express what is going on. So in the inside, the soul is still very beautiful and light and submitted to Allah Jalla wa'ala, but it can't express, it doesn't know how to use the body to share what, yani the ancient soul doesn't know how to use the body to express what it thinks. Do you understand? So it just goes ah, like this, but in reality, the old soul is trying to make sense of something, but it can't share it. So we believe that whenever the body suffers, it doesn't mean that on the inside, the soul suffers, that's number one. And even if it would be the case, we still say, yani the pain anybody has will increase his level in paradise. That's it. So the reason of the existence was then just one, then he was born, then he lived for a year or half a year. It was what? To come into the world so that Allah would give you the chance to live forever. And then yani the, 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 the eventual pain will elevate then once again its rank. So it didn't go through all the problems of 80, life, 80 years on the face of the earth. It went through problems with, which hurts us, right? It's normal. But we know that when, we, when the baby itself will see the end result, and when the parents will see the end result, that they know that it was to receive something bigger. You can be happy for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years on the face of the earth, but lose each other for an eternity. Or you can be together for a shorter amount of time, but because of the affliction and pain, live together in the highest levels of paradise for an eternity. So it is, as a Muslim, we have to fill in you know, these things with our faith. Um, and, and this becomes more and more difficult. Because we, we in this society, we only go by things we see. Um, we go by things that we see. Like I was talking to Leith, and it was a year ago. And he had like, uh, we, we bought him a little toy. And for him, that was the strongest thing on the face of the earth. And then I said, Dada, this one is even stronger than Allah. You know? And then I went, <gasps> and I said, no, it's okay. That's not aqidah, right? <laughs> There's just a child playing in his imaginary world. So you've got parents and flipping out and say, oh, my son will be a kafir. What's going on? No, it's, it's okay. Then you explain, no, he's from the... And then he can say like, but I don't see Allah. He told me that. He said, I can't see him. And that's why in the beginning with children, the, the, the best thing to do is to live as a Muslim and they will just follow what you do. But they will ask questions and these questions don't make them kafir. No, <laughs> they don't make them kafir, nor bad future Muslims. It are just questions. Like, I cannot see him. Then I tell him, oh, do you see... I, it was a couple of days ago. Um... I said, yeah, do you see the trees? Do you see this? And he said, who put them there? And then he said, I don't know. I said, Allah drew them for us. I said, it's not because you don't see him that he's not there. Look. And I went behind the door. And I said, Leith, do I exist? Yes, Dada. He said, you exist. I said, do you see me? He said, no. He says, but I said, you, you don't see me, but I'm there, right? He said, yes. I said, we don't see Allah and he's there where we cannot see him. And then he made the link and now it's clear for him. It's not because we don't see him that he doesn't exist. So just, if you think about it, God, I even don't know how I got there. Yes, it is, we, we belong to Allah. And the moment you are in harmony with that thought, 
is the moment you set yourself free from many feelings. And that for me, it's always the last obstacle on your path, on your way to Allah, is to be with your heart and mind in line with what he has decreed. So the first thing was his knowledge, then it is his mashia, he wants it, done. Why did he allow? He wanted it, done. Not to hurt you, even if it hurts you, but a surgeon operates on you not to hurt you, even if it may hurt. Even for three months, you may be recovering. Your knee, knee operation or meniscus, whatever it may be, he didn't put a knife in your legs to hurt you, even if he knew that it would hurt temporarily, but he knew that eventually it would heal you and please you. And that's the Qadha al It comes to heal us, not to hurt us. So then is, yani, the, the next one is Al-Kitaba. Al-Kitaba meaning that Allah has written everything. 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and earth. Inna Allah kataba kitaban. And kataba kitaban yani qada. So when they say write, he's not the writer. He, he ordered the pen to write. No. But it's as he has written it. So that's the third thing. And the fourth thing is al-khalq. Is that Allah has created everything. Um, that is also Qadar Qadar. Yani everything which happens is creation from Allah and it is not separate from what He wants. So these are the four pillars. When you believe in Qadar al Qadar, the stronger your Iman is in these four, the, the more likely you will be to accept with your heart in the situation you are in. One, it was written long before you were created. Two, it is with the will of Allah. He wants it. Three, it is with the knowledge of Allah, he knows it. And four, he's the one that creates it. Yes. So so these are the four pillars of, of al Iman bil Qadar al Qadr. So if the one who's going through atrocity in a war, torture, yes. this, this is what gets them. Yes. Yeah. That's what Allah wanted for them. Yeah. Wanted for them, he puts them in a place where it happens, right? Yeah. The, the human being still has a free will. But he may put you in. He wants you to be married to a certain person. That person is not good for you. Because he wants to get out certain things of you. But you don't have to stay with that person either, right? So the situations we go through, they say we are the feather that is being blown by the wind. No? The feather th still thinks like when you're a boat, on a boat with a child. No? The child thinks it's moving freely. Because it goes from the front to the back of the, of the boat, right? Left, right, this, that. But in reality, the boat itself is on a course. It's in it's sailing in a certain direction, which the child has no control over whatsoever. And this is us in the Qadar wal Qadar. We have that free, free movement going on, but in the midst of the oceans that we have no control over. He's the captain, figuratively speaking. So the, 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 does that make sense? Same with the pilot. We're in the plane. I think, oh, I'm going to the front of the plane, to the back of the plane. But in reality, I'm in a situation where I have no control whatsoever in the direction I'm heading. And this is the Qadr wal Qadr. We have been given that free will that we use to respond to the part where we have no control over. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Sometimes you don't have control over the situation you're in and you can't get out of it. With your mind you have. Um, like for example, torture. You might be tortured, but mentally you can feel yourself. Yes. So that's what we say. Sometimes you end up in a situation where you cannot change something, but with your mind you're still connected to the to the to the Lord Almighty Subhanahu Wa Taala who puts you there. And this is why some of the prophets were killed. For example, um, some of the pro prophets they they were tortured. They were killed. But with their mind, they were still free to interpret what they were going through in the light of the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. So as long as they don't hold on, they don't captivate your mind, then you will keep a certain strength, I believe. Mind, I was talking more about situations where your mind is also captivated by something really evil. You mean like people manipulating, uh, like uh, psychological abuse and these kind of things, for example? That that happens, yes. Excuse me. Yeah, I believe, barakallahu fikum, that a lot goes back to the way that we are raised as Muslims today, 
if if we as Muslims were been given the correct aqidah to start with, instead of just thinking about rules, then we would have been strong Muslims. And then being manipulated would not been as easy either because we would have had the tools, but we don't know how to protect ourselves, which is not our fault. We don't know how to put our trust in Allah 100% because we were not taught how to do that. So I think a lot of the problems can be overcome in the future if we teach children from the very beginning how to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and if you are connected to Allah, you are strong in, in any situation, that whatever situation you may end up in. Um, Allah may, may, may Allah make it easy for people who are being afflicted. But eventually that is being the Muslim. It is even if you are in these worst situations that you still, that your belief is, is your backbone. Um, that you look at the happenings not through your emotions but through what Allah wanted. And then you have the choice. I want to be a Muslim or I don't. And that's what I always tell people. If you choose for Islam or do you happen to be a Muslim and then you start cherry picking? Like, oh, this I, okay, this I take, this I don't accept, this I question, this I don't question. When you start questioning the core of your belief, maybe it's better to take a step back and then look at your belief and say, is this for me? Instead of being partially Muslim, no? And that's very dangerous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yani, ya amanu fi silmi kafa. Believers enter into religion, into the entirety of it. And Allah says, do you believe in a part of the book and do you reject a part of the book? And we, this is what a lot of Muslims are doing today. They reject many parts of the book. No? Especially in, in our woke uh, uh, time, no? generation, where people start doubting everything which is being said. Today people are claiming something and Within 500 years, they will be saying something else. And this is uh, my mother went to a library um, and um, she told me this morning when I was on my way here. And she read in a book of the 16th, 16th century or any 1500, 1600. And it said, like, and even women in our days speak good Dutch, although they remain in their houses. Although that they don't leave their houses. That was back in the days, right? A woman would stay at home. That is how it was. And in Islam, that doesn't exist, right? A woman can just go, and he just, just you know, is as free as a bee. So, um, but, but this was the culture. So you see that in the European culture, it was like, women speak good Dutch, even though they stay at home. Yeah, so where did they get the language from? So if you would write that today, you would go viral. <laughs> Who does he think he is and this and that? So you see things, and it's good that this doesn't exist anymore like that, but you see that things keep on changing. But the only thing that doesn't change is the way that Allah tells us to look at life and to live life. The akhlaq that Allah gave to the Muslims is an akhlaq that is beneficial and beautiful in any time. In 500 years, that will still be beneficial. It will still be good. It will still be praiseworthy. It doesn't change. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a universal message that will be fit for every time and place. That, that's the beauty. So, so Islam doesn't make you like, oh, what should I think today? It's just, no, you think one thing. You have one Rabb and your Rabb wants one thing. And that thing is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. So we, we don't have to hop on everything. Yani, like, okay, let me just hop on the wagon and jump on the wagon and go, uh, you know, travel with them. Just stay who you are. You don't have to change. The only thing which has to change is you have to become a better person every day. Work on your patience, you work on your perseverance, on your trust in Allah, on being a source of happiness for the people. That's the only thing that needs change. The rest is constant. Okay, in the Bata He does whatsoever he wants and pleases. Done. Then Hal attack a hadith or junut. What does it say? Has word reached you of the faith of the legions? Mm. So yes, it had reached him. Um, so it is not a question. And this is why a lot of uh, scholars they say here, Hal is qad. Um, hell, yani with the meaning of Qad, certainly the news of Thamud, 
هل أتاك حديث الجنود of the armies and the groups and the troops نعم so has reached you so read it it has word reached you of the fate of the legions نعم the the the, the word of the legions has reached you and then the next one. Pharaoh and Thamud Pharaoh and Thamud rather are those uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking here but Quraysh is listening right so Quraysh although Hating Muhammad ﷺ, they were always curious. And they always wanted to know what is being revealed. So they, they would hear. So, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْجُنُودِ فِرْعَوْنَ وَثَمُودِ بَلِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي تَكْذِيبِ So Allah is telling Quraysh, you very well know what happened to Thamud. You know what happened to Fir'aun. And all of them were, yani, to all of them a prophet was sent and all of them refused to listen. So why do you think that you would be any different? All while you are but Bedouins in a tent riding a camel, while Fir'aun had that kingdom, as it were, not a kingdom, he has that, how do you, would you call that? Anyway, so he would, he, he would you know, own Misr and have thousands of camels and horses and people working for him and troops and generals. and you know, they, they were far strong, they were stronger than you were. Nevertheless, they were destroyed. So why do you think that you will not be destroyed? The same for us. Why do we think that we will not be destroyed? While the Romans were destroyed. Our houses are not as strong as the things that the Romans made. You know, when you, when you look at these pillars and everything they built, right? So why do we think that we will, that we will you know, if we keep on rejecting the message, why would we, not, why would we be spared? So this is what Allah is saying. So why do you even have the feeling that the world cannot be destroyed at any point? Why does everybody think that now the only way for our civilization to end is by the coming of the end of the world? That is what each any people thought. Like, okay, we are, you know, so it's, it's actually... It is always when you think that you have reached the climax of your existence, and as a non-believer or as a, somebody who doesn't think of God, that the end is near. It is when people start going against God willingly and unwillingly in every rule and in every word and in everything that they do. And that is then where people are being erased by Allah and then new people come. So it is not just the end of the world which will bring an end to civilization but also going against Allah and then they are raised and new people come they are raised new people come they are erased new people come that's the way it works so Allah says lima yurid. he does what he wants so you have no certainty um, you, you, you have no security so lima yurid. Junood, wa thamud. Fi min muhid. what does it mean in muhid while Allah com compasses them around from behind. Allah encompasses around from behind. Encompasses. And it's compasses, 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 yeah. While Allah compasses them around from behind. That's what Sheikh did. Yes. So anyway. Compasses target. Look, you can be in front of someone and you can be behind someone, right? Mm -hmm. Allah says, Min warahim. So Allah observes them from behind. Meaning, they don't see him and they think, oh, I can do what I want. There you go. You see? So meaning that in front of them, there doesn't seem to be any barrier. There doesn't seem to be any obstacle in exceeding in their dhulm, exceeding in their vulgar behavior, um, eccentric behavior and so forth. And then it looks like somebody was all the time there observing and said, this is enough. Um, that's wallahu min wara'ihim muhiyat. Um, so they don't see him, they don't think of him. There's the ways, the doors to controlling the world seem to be open. Um, everybody's speaking uh, about the new world order and this and that. Where did you get this from? Just by looking at YouTube and uh, uh, conspiracy theory and then, then Illuminati and I don't know what. Oh, it's a new world order. Do, do, do you really think that Allah has no control over the world? That you start attributing ultimate power to creation and therewith making people fearful and passive 
waiting for what the world is going to decide to happen. Allah decides. So this is why we, we, we shouldn't just speak. I, I still feel very free. I'm so free. I'm, I'm so free. You are so free. You're only in prison because you look at social media and then you have an idea in your head if you now shut down social media for two weeks, three weeks, and don't watch the news for that time being for a month, you are free. You go to work, you live a happy life, you eat very well. Yes, prices are, are going up. Then, well, then we buy a bit less. I used to buy one milk thing per week. Now it's per week and a half. So what's the problem? Just a glass of milk less. Uh, if we would throw away bread, well, now we have to keep it. And so you, you, you cope with it. Of course, electricity is another story. But, you know, I'm just trying to, to say you are free. You can pray when you want. I can go to the park here and I pray. I can read Quran. With Juma, I can go to the mosque. You can wear hijab. There is a center here filled with Muslims. Why do we always have that feeling of almost an anxiety for something bad to happen? Why we are as free as we were? Do you really think that the non-believers, that they will not go with the flow uh, in, uh, in relation to gender, in relation to homosexuality and so forth? And of course they will say religion should not be taught because they're not religious. Like a Muslim who is a Muslim, he will not say we will teach now Marxism or co communism or atheism, whatever, in our schools. They wouldn't. Why? Because they are Muslims. So it is not an anti-Islamic movement. It is just a non-believing society or a disbelieving society where and if you don't believe in a god then there are certain ethics and moral values that you do not have because you feel that human being is has right over his or her own body so and then we shouldn't always interpret it as this is un anti-islamic no i mean the jews don't agree uh, many christians don't agree many non-muslims don't agree many so it is not an anti-Islamic movement. It is just the result of not believing in a God. And then you say, and not everybody who does not believe in a God, but I, I've, I was born free. Who are you to tell me what I am? And who are you to tell me what to do with my body? And so forth. So this is yani, normal. Now, I, I think it's not correct huh? because I believe that religion should be taught because it is as valid or yani, from, from their perspective as any other thought any related to life and life philosophy. But anyway, um, don't expect non-Muslims to teach Islam, right? Or to speak about halal and haram. So this is why we are very free. Please believe this. The moment that you lose your freedom, that they come to your house and shave your beard, that they inject paint into your eyes because they don't like black eyes or brown eyes and they want blue the moment they say that your name Muhammad and Zainab is no longer allowed the moment that you they 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 yani, tell you you're not allowed to wear your hijab you're not allowed to pray to say the name of Allah to have Eid in a park that's when you have lost your freedom but we are so focused on what we hear that we forget about the life we live Okay, so that's what we've said, Khayyam. We've said like we are very free. Hate in a park, is that freedom? No. Places where you can pray in public spaces. In some schools, some universities, they have khutbah. I, I, I was giving khutbah, the living khutbah at LSE, at so as an imperial. Three yani, pre prestigious universities around the world they pray, hundreds of people. Sisters with hijab, they, you go to Tesco's, you see Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak. So why do you have the feeling that you're not free? Regardless. Regardless. All the rest was for all the cities and the whole England. The freedom. Do you really feel quite the same way? Would you? What do you mean? Going to the Welsh valleys and uh, in the what valleys? The Welsh, the Welsh 
I would. Yeah, I would. So I'm, I'm more, I, I, I prefer a positive note over a negative one. So I think there are many, many ways to, to make people despair and turn a, an actually very positive message into a negative one. But I don't believe in that. I believe in a positive one. So um, that's it. So now the only thing that is left to do for Muslims is that we need Muslims in very important positions around the world, in countries where they are part of the decision making. No? Because either we have very extreme Muslims that don't have any knowledge of life, like we, <laughs> not extreme, like in Belgium we had an Islamic party. Do you know what their first demand was? We want separate buses for men and women. That was it. Wow. That was all their agenda. We, <laughs> <laughs> that was it. So they said separate <laughs> buses, yeah, transport, public transport for men and women. Really? Yeah, that was it. That, yeah. was American, that, that was it. So yeah. So what we want is Muslims who know life and who know their religion and not when they see money who change their mind. Who speak the truth and speak out and who care about Muslims and non-Muslims. But we need them. Why? Well, we are in a democratic system where you can use the system. I'm not saying abuse the system to better your own situation. But then we have these Muslims that say, no, politics is haram, this is haram, that is haram. But then we will end up living haram because we didn't try to stop it. We didn't try to you know, better our situation. So we let other people decide. And they don't decide because they hate Muslims. They decide because they don't think it's important, that religion is important. So this is why we still have this freedom as well. So where are the people? Um, so this is what we should be working on as well. Like if you see that you have a certain strength or a certain interest, uh, by means of which you can be of benefit to the Muslims, then you should, you should literally do that. It becomes a fardai. It is a fardain. It is a fard. I think even a bigger fard than becoming a scholar. Becoming a, sp a scholar takes 30 years, 20 years, whatever it may be. But doing this here can be done immediately. So don't, don't delay it because it will only become more and more difficult. In Belgium, girls are no longer allowed to wear hijab at school. They come to, to the door, they have to take it off. Then when they go out, they can put it on again. And there's a mirror, mashallah. Yes, and we've provided for the Muslims, you know, the Muslim girls, a nice little mirror. So, you know, that they can tidy up their hair and they look nice. So it's not like take it off and so they they actually you know boast like look what we did we facilitated it so and this is now what is happening in, in Belgium it's like apartheid in, uh, in in Africa South Africa back in the days you know it's it's discrimination without any doubt and they will always blame it on being neutral neutrality being neutral so without any outward any uh, symbols or or, or manifestations of religion but not believing is also a way of life and is also is also what a life philosophy so the absence of the sign is a sign so anyway in the battlefield so they keep on going 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 but that one day it stops huh? بَلْ هُوَ قُرْآنٌ مَجِيدٌ فِي لَوْحٍ مَحْفُوظٍ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, this is a noble Qur'an in preserved tablet. Meaning, yani it is, has been written on the tablets in the skies. That is where the Qur'an was first written and then it was descended. Uh, yani, uh, verse per verse. So in very brief, yani, why does Allah speak about the Qur'an at the end? Yani, to tell you, don't doubt anything I've said. This is the Qur'an. This is my word. This is... Um, my reality and it is the only reality so live in the light of it so don't despair for me this, this surah is saying like Muslims before us have been persecuted, have been and even as we speak killed and, and so forth but it never brought an end to Islam it never brought an end to Islam um, so everything what happened to the Muslims should have, have already you know, terminated Islam and Muslims just think about the colonizations for hundreds of years in the Muslim countries. 
And subhanAllah, he just created a revival of religion. They brought it to them, to their lands. Yes. Now, now they brought Islam to their land, the, their, up there, oh. any, to the European lands. SubhanAllah, they went to destroy, and the Muslims came in peace. And they're just living in peace, and Islam is growing. They, they can't, the people can't leave their houses without seeing a hijab or a beard. SubhanAllah. Like, this is ajeeb. And that's why one of my scholars said, like, remember, Salat al-Mustaqim is like a tree. The more you chop its branches, the stronger they grow. So the more you cut in Islam, the more it will grow. But now for me, it's time. Imagine if all of the Muslims were qualitative Muslims. So now we're talking about quantity. Imagine now having preachers, teachers that go around the world and they all have groups of 100 people. And they all teach them fiqh and tasawwuf, nothing else. Fiqh, how to worship Allah. Tasawwuf, meaning the signs of purification of outward behavior and inward state, spiritual state. Imagine that all the Muslims now around the world, 1 billion, 700 million or more, they now all are people of fiqh and tasawwuf. And that's why the Prophet said, when he said, yeah, people, they will just conquer you. They said, I mean, qillatina nahnu ya Rasulullah. He said, because we will be uh, little in number, ya Rasulullah. He said, no. He said, because uh, there will be wahan in your hearts. They said, wa wahan, ya Rasulullah. Qala hubbu dunya wa karahiyatul mawt. He said, because of the wahan. And they said, al wahan is the love for dunya and the hate to die. And the hating to die. Is everything okay? Uh, it is love for the dunya and disliking death. And he said, when that happens, you will lose your religion. Love for the dunya and disliking death. And that's when you compromise. That's when you give up on Allah, on the deen. So this is the reason. So how do we restore the fact that we can't be harmed or wronged, it is by not loving dunya and looking forward to death. So that is the main ingredient to get the ummah back on track. Back on track. Anyway, what is the question? What is meant by shaheed, martyr witness for people in the battlefield or someone who had a stomach ailment? This is from the last lesson. Also say it again. What is meant by shaheed, the martyr, the witness for people in the battlefield or someone who had a stomach ailment? Uh, well, yani, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned many people that were shuhada. No? He said the shaheed, the martyr, is the one, yes, of course, that, that dies on the battlefield protecting his country or her country. Um, but it is also a person that was burnt. No? So, for example, he, he went up in flames or a person that drowned um, or a person that dies uh, because of problems with his intestines because that is very painful it was a very painful death also when uh, he's crushed and crumbled any under a mountain or a building whatever and also a person or a woman that dies when they're delivering a child when when, when she's giving birth to a child and dies she shaheed as well so the main difference would be that we would pray for these people but not for the one sorry that we would Wash these people, but not the one that died in the battlefield. No, so that that would be a main difference, one of the main differences. But they are all called shuhada, and they are all called martyrs. Wallahu alam. Yes. Another question. Somebody a question? Nothing. Allah akbar. Those people who have the most terrible illnesses, <coughs> maybe not stomach or intestines, yes. nevertheless have bits of their bodies falling off, like, yes. like in Gandhi. Yes. You couldn't imagine anything more painful. Yes. Um, is that, is it, they would be considered to be shaheed as well. Yes. Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ gave the example of that, but it was, was actually a reflection of any you know, painful death that a person, so it was more. Re reflecting that and literally uh, yes MashaAllah, a beautiful quote from Mama Amina 
quoting you. We are the feather being blown by the wind. Our belief in what Allah wants is our backbone. Pain will increase our level in paradise. It is to heal, not to hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's that's a nice uh, upshot. Yes. So Nowadays, though, there's modern medicine that allows you not to feel pain. Yes. How does that impact the understanding? I, I, I still think that even if you're not in pain, there I think there is a level of pain. And even if a level of pain will not be there, there, are, there is still the, the difficulty of living. I mean, that, that comes with the disease, isn't it? Maybe the difficulty of breathing, the difficulty of moving, the difficulty of doing so many different things. So I, I believe that it is the one that dies because of a sickness, not because of elderdom, for example, but rather you go through that process of hurting and of, of so many different things that, that makes you a shaheed. That's what I believe. All these, all these pain medications that have their own side effects. So there's, there's suffering all the time. Yeah. You, you don't have the pain, you have the effects of the pain medication. As well. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else, uh, something positive? Like that, that's going to make us happy. There was some positivity, right, in what I said, no? Well, was it only in negative? I think it's all positive in the sense that... It's all positive, yeah. Yeah, because actually you're... you're We're free. free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We freed ourselves from every difficulty, because in every difficulty there, it's a reminder back to Allah SWT that actually he's put us in this situation. So we're happy. You better remove that from your finger before <laughs> it stops your blood flow again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, but did you understand what I meant yes. by we are free? Yes. Yes. We, we have imprisoned ourselves with our minds. Yes. So like you talked about the children and when we're teaching the children yes. that we shouldn't focus more on the rules, but we should teach them yes. connection to Allah. Yes. Allah yes. Um, which ways can we do that strengthen that in, from, from the books that we teach? From, um, I don't believe that children should be taught the essence of, of spirituality by means of teaching them when they sit down behind a desk, for example. I believe the spirituality is passed on by the parents in the community. And because what we are doing now, we teach them Islam through a book. When you look at Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was different. It would be a way of life. And then yes, they would gather in the mosque, there would be a talk and they would go and they would imitate their parents. So what we do now is we teach them things, but then they find a community that is not in line with what they are being taught. You know, so, so you teach them patience, you teach them love for Allah, you teach them this and that. And then they even don't find this in their own parents. So how are they now going to become what you are not? I'm not saying you as a person, you probably are, but myself or many other people. So I believe that the teaching you now should be done differently at the core. It is, it is you know, passed on by being, not by talking. Which doesn't mean that we don't speak about it, we don't teach them, but that is secondary. So I think the first step is really that you, you are, and when you are, monkey see, monkey do. That, that's, that's the way it works. Huh? It's the same with people learning Arabic. They think I need to memorize a dictionary. When did you, as a child, Use a dictionary to learn how to speak. Nam, no. Nam, no. you understand what I mean? No child uses a dictionary to 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 learn the basis of uh, the basic the basic language, right? So you don't do that. You just absorb what is being said and you speak like they speak. And then now people say, "Oh, I want to learn Arabic." Oh, you have to learn fifty words per week by heart. That will not teach you any Arabic. You will not use the words, and they will go to any. They will be removed from your brain. So this is why I, I, I don't believe in teaching or, or limiting ourselves to teaching behind the desk. I, I don't believe this. That's why what Karima used to do is very good. Like when they would go to the to down the shore, or what was it yeah. called? Yeah. The residential uh, Osmond to the Yeah. The seaside. Seaside, yes. So that's very good because they see things and it should it should be done more, I think, more frequently. Not talking about the logistics, of course, but more frequently. And if that would be like three, four times a year, like five days, then these children, they will learn, they will absorb things like, that's what I believe. Yeah, I don't know.
Somebody else? Nobody? I, I, I love how Allah, how infliction and tribulations are merely means to increase our rank with Allah and how it's meant to bring out the best of us. It reminds me of the, of the wood of al Badud. Ah, oh, subhanAllah, yes. yes. Uh, this final one. Last how, question. How, how is the shaheed a witness? How is the shaheed a witness? Well, the martyr, because um, he's readiness to give his or her readiness to give her life for the sake of Allah Jalla wa ala is the biggest testimony of the person's faith and that's why they are called shaheed they are witness I'm meaning their life witnesses that they are all yani, ready to live for Allah and die for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can they intercede for us on the day of excuse me can they yes they can intercede yes martyrs in, in intercede for us Yes, and parents also for their children. Um, children that died before their parents can intercede for their parents as well. Um, people that memorize the Quran can intercede as well. So many people can intercede, really. Jazakallah khairan wa barakallah fikum wa sallallahu wa sallam 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 Also, have a look at Kingston Muslim Association channel. I've started since yesterday um, uh, a journey through the end of times. Um, in the khutab. So it's a transformative journey through the end of times. Yeah, the Jum'ah khutab.